I've called this short paper Catholic Art Conceptions and Misconceptions, or maybe five things you never knew about Catholic art. And I'm going to use this time to talk about some of the stories surrounding the conception and birth of the Virgin Mary. I've got some competition. Hallelujah. Whoops. <laughs> Having changed from being an evangelical Presbyterian to being a Roman Catholic in my late 20s, I know how resistant many non-Catholics are to Mary, particularly when it comes to doctrines like the Immaculate Conception. I hope some of you will go away from this talk today feeling curious to find out more, but you might go away thinking it's a whole lot worse than you ever imagined. But at the very least, when you visit Europe's great cathedrals and art galleries, you might not be quite so puzzled by some of the less familiar Catholic paintings that you encounter. This talk was partly prompted from, by an email I got from a non-Catholic friend who was on holiday in Florence last year. And she sent me an email saying, what is the Immaculate Conception? I keep seeing these paintings and I don't know what they are. So... Now, I think this cartoon says something like Mary saying to Joseph, I keep telling you it was immaculate. I don't keep asking you where you were that night. Well, funny joke maybe, but completely wrong. The immaculate conception does not refer to Mary's virginal conception of Christ. That's the virgin birth. The Immaculate Conception is the belief that Mary herself was conceived by her mother, St. Anne, free from original sin. Now, I'm already presenting you with a whole lot of theological baggage I'm not going to explain or justify, but believe me, the Virgin Mary was conceived in her mother's womb free from original sin, if you accept the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception but she was sexually conceived. This is another very important doctrine to get your head round. Onto the next screen, we should have lots of little immaculate conceptions. And if you go to any art gallery in Europe, including the National Gallery, where we have the Velázquez Immaculate Conception in London, which is one of the most famous, you'll encounter these kinds of paintings, which are derived from Spanish art of the Counter-Reformation. But today, I'm going to backtrack, and I'm going to talk about Mary's conception in pre-Reformation art, before the Reformation divided Christian's way of looking at these things, and the Catholic Church decided to tidy up and put its own house in order by getting rid of some of its more flamboyant medieval devotions. There's a second century text known as the Protevangelium of James, which was very widely distributed in the Western Church, and fell into disuse between the 4th century and the Middle Ages, but has always been a key text in the Eastern Orthodox Church. It tells of the conception, birth, and childhood of Mary up to the flight into Egypt. And it tells how she was conceived by an elderly barren couple, St. Anna, or Anne, modelled on Hannah of the Old Testament, and Joachim. And usually in such stories, it was Joachim, not Anna, who was held responsible for their childlessness. And in old age, he was sent into the wilderness by the elders of Israel as punishment for his barrenness. But an angel visited Anna as she sat in her home, lamenting the loss of her husband and her childlessness. And the angel said to Anna, go and meet your husband at the gate of the city, at Jerusalem's golden gate, because an angel is visiting him too, and you're going to have a child. Have we got lots of kisses? A kiss? <laughs> so Anna and Joachim rush to meet each other, he from the wilderness, she from the house, and fall into one another's arms at the golden gate of Jerusalem. And this was for two or three centuries from about the late 12th to the early 16th century, the most popular way of depicting the Virgin's conception. And the next slide shows numerous different versions of this. Um, 
some more pious souls like to believe that the kiss itself was the moment when Mary was conceived. But as I say, the church always insisted that she was sexually conceived. And medieval theologians had some interesting debates about whether this was a rather distasteful duty that the elderly Anna and Joachim went home and did out of obedience to God, or whether it was the best sex there had ever been since the beginning of creation. I like the latter version. <laughs> but one of the things to remember is that devotion and religion, whatever it is, always reflect the culture within which it belongs in one form or another, particularly highly visual religious cultures. And some, are, some scholars argue that what we see in the rise of the cult of St. Anne is the increasing influence of the matriarchal women of the emergent Middle Ages in late medieval families, of the, the emergent... Um, middle classes in late medieval families. So St. Anne is the epitome of the well-to-do bourgeois matron presiding over her brood. Now, the next painting I show you looks like a nativity. And again, you'll see hundreds of these. If you go to the v &A in London, you'll see lots. You'll see them all over Europe. It's not a nativity because it's a domestic interior, usually with women in attendance. And this is the birth of the Virgin. The Protevangelium tells of how Anne exclaimed her joy when a child was born and she was told it was a girl. She says, thank God, a girl is born to me today. It's the only example I've ever come across in any religious tradition of a parent rejoicing over the birth of a daughter. And there are several more of those births of the virgins there. But also the next slide shows many images of St. Anne teaching her young daughter to read, St. Anne teaching the Virgin to read as a child. And again, it's an example of a lovely mother-daughter relationship replete with holiness and love, which many feminists would say is very lacking from the father-son tradition or the two blokes and a bird trinity of Christianity. Um, it's also a challenge to those who think that medieval women were illiterate and barbaric, because certainly in the upper classes and those who could afford it, there was a high level of literacy. The next set of images, the grandson comes on the scene. And this gives rise to a genre of paintings known as St. Anne Trinitarian. Again, one of the most famous ones is in the National Gallery. It's the Leonardo, St. Anne with the Virgin and Child. And this earthly trinity is intended to reflect the heavenly trinity. It's the humanity of Christ, which derives from maternal flesh. In medieval biology, there was the belief that the mother sort of incubated the soul by giving it its flesh, its materiality. And the father's seed prepared the child to receive the soul from God. So because there was no male seed involved in the conception of Christ, his flesh was entirely feminine. It was from his mother and hers was from her grandmother. It was from her mother. And uh, Christ's divinity, of course, was from God. So St. Anne here becomes an image of the earthly trinity. And if we move on one further, I hope you can now see St. Anne, the virgin and child, sitting horizontally with a vertical image of God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Christ, which very much gives a sense of what was known as the heavenly and earthly trinity in this particular genre of art. Now, again, as the family changes and as the modern nuclear family begins to displace the medieval feudal family, we get another change, and the image here I've used is Murillo. It's also called the Heavenly and Earthly Trinity. Sorry, it's Zubaran. And it's in, is it Zubaran or Murillo? I can't remember which, Murillo. It's also in the National Gallery in London, and it shows now St. Joseph, young and virile, in the place of St. Anne in the Holy Family. So one message for those Christian dogmatists today who are terribly worried about... Um, the family and its place in society. Christian families have looked very different across ages and cultures, depending on which families we're talking about. In medieval art, Joseph was usually portrayed as a rather bewildered old man to account for the fact that he was able to respect the virginity of his beautiful young wife. However, if we look further, the next images I show are usually of St. Anne and the Virgin and Christ in the same pose, surrounded by a whole group of women and children. Who are they? 
Well, in the medieval lives of the saints, stories proliferated around the extended family of Christ, partly to account for the people referred to as his brothers and sisters in the Gospels, and to account for two women, Mary Cleopas and Mary Salome, who are also mentioned in the Gospels, Mary Salome at the foot of the cross. So in the Middle Ages, never for want of a story, they wove a family legend around Christ's extended family. And this is a tradition known as St. Anne Trinubium, St. Anne of the Three Marriages. And the story was that when Joachim, father of the Virgin Mary, died, St. Anne went on and married Cleopas, by whom she had a daughter called Mary Cleopas. And then she went and married Salome when Cleopas died and had a daughter called Mary Salome. And the children of Mary Salome and Mary Cleopas account for various of the brothers and sisters and cousins of Christ. Now, you're not going to be able to see this, but I do have a little image where I have all the names on it. And if we go on beyond that, again, I'll just talk to you about what it shows there. You see this whole extended maternal family sitting in an enclosed garden, which is, again, a very popular medieval genre. It comes from the Song of Songs, where Mary is described, where the, the lover is described as a garden enclosed, um, and Mary was associated with that enclosed garden. She was the garden that only Christ um, inhabited, so her womb was the garden enclosed. But this garden enclosed also becomes the scene of an idyllic setting of the maternal family of Christ. And if you look closely, I'll put a link up to this on Google. If you look closely, you see this is also an image of Eden restored. There's a child who's killing the serpent. Uh, so the serpent in Eden is destroyed. Mary is giving an apple to Christ. Christ is the new Adam. Mary has been known as the new Eve since the second century. So the woman who gave the man the fruit of death now gives the man the fruit of life by being the mother of Christ. Um, I'm trying. Uh, the other thing I want to point out about this little image, I'm remembering because I've thought I'd have it in front of me, is that if you look closely, you also see Elizabeth with the child John the Baptist in this garden, because of course Elizabeth is another one of this extended family. She's the cousin of Mary. And John the Baptist is pointing to a lamb in the middle of the garden whose breast is bleeding into a chalice. So that's the Eucharist. But if we look further, the finger is pointing onwards to a mother who's breastfeeding her baby. And that baby is the only one of the maternal and infant grouping without a halo in this garden. There are two donors who don't have halos, but all the women and children in the garden have halos, except this one infant at the breast. Now, this is a very obscure piece of art. I found it by accident. It's the wing of an altar, and the rest of the altar is lost. But my own conjecture is that this child at the breast represents the Christian, the ordinary Christian worshipper who would have been in the mass and perhaps likened to the one who is fed on a diet of milk in the words of St. Paul because he's not yet mature and ready for a diet of the meat of the Gospels. So the breastfed infant without a halo, I think, is the penitent, um, self-effacing worshipper feeling not worthy to have the halo that all the others have. And I want to conclude on that note by moving from those images to an image of Mary with her exposed breast and Christ sleeping on it, holding an apple which very much mirrors the shape of her breast. And again, this is a kind of redemptive piece. Christ the new Adam holds the fruit of life, and Mary's breast becomes the fruit of life that gives life to the saviour of the world. But Mary is also holding a prayer book, and she has her finger in two pages. One of them is the Magnificat, which of course is her song of joy when she visits Elizabeth, when she conceives Christ. And the other is the Dei Profundus, the Mass of the Dead, which the, the psalm which was sung at the Mass of the Dead. And so this image anticipates the Pieta with the dead Christ in the Virgin's arms. And on the altar in front of her, there's a bunch of grapes representing the Eucharist. There's a pomegranate, which is full of seeds, so it represents fertility. And there's a sliced lemon, which represents the bitterness of the cross. 
Again, this is a very, very common genre in medieval art, which got eliminated, really, from the scene in the Counter-Reformation when the Catholic Church became far more moralistic, far more restrained in what it allowed its devotees and artists to represent in order not to bring scandal. Joachim and Anna kissing at the Golden Gate was seen as a temptation to concupiscence because everyone would be imagining what they went home and did next. Hence, we got the Virgin floating up to heaven on the clouds to replace that image. But the question I would end with, if we go back and look at images like that breastfeeding virgin, I do wonder how an exclusively male priesthood can represent these multifaceted Eucharistic themes of fertility, birth, and maternal nurture, which were such a central part of medieval art and devotion.